James Bezik. I'm a principal developer advocate in AWS Serverless. I've been a serverless geek for quite a few years, and before I was a DA, I was a software developer for quite a long time, as well as a product manager. But the most important thing on this slide is my email address and Twitter handle. So after the conference, if you're building anything and you have any questions, please reach out to me, and I'll do my very best to help. So we've got 40 minutes today, and I'm going to spend about 10 or 15 minutes going through some introductory ideas and show you some best practices and ways you can think about serverless design. And this is a no-code talk, so you'll find as you get into serverless, there's, there's very little code. I'm really focusing on the architecture. I'll talk about some common ways that developers think about servers and then how you change that as you move towards serverless. And then really the purpose today, more than anything, is to show you some of the architectural best practices that you can use and immediately put into effect as you build applications. But most of the time, we'll be talking through actual examples. And servers become this atomic unit in our thinking when we're building applications. But there are some difficult problems to handle with this older way of building apps. So it's difficult to scale. So a session state is tied to a server, but if you scale very rapidly, like Amazon.com does, how do you keep up with that? Also, it can be very wasteful. So if you're not using 100% of all of the CPU and network capacity and everything that you've got in your server, you're not really using everything that you're paying for. There's also a lot to manage that's not directly related to the code in your application. So you've got things like operating systems, networking, security, and so forth. And so it can really be an ongoing task just to keep the server alive. And it's not necessarily something you want to focus on as a developer. So here's an example. So to run a production website with a moderate amount of traffic, you'd need this kind of configuration. This is a reference architecture I pulled for Word from WordPress that shows the best practice layout within AWS. But really, it could apply to any LAMP-style application, anything with Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. So every time there's a web page request here, the web server is querying a relational database for the page structure, loading plugins and themes, and then serving this HTML page. And that's really a lot of work going on when really many of the pages may just be static and not changing that frequently. And so when we talk about serverless, people think we're just removing EC2 instances or other hardware-based servers that you have in your on-premise environment. But actually, there's a lot of other stuff, too. There's security groups, there's subnets, auto-scaling policies. And you really need a cloud architect or a DevOps professional to help you if you're running this style of application. And so in serverless, more than anything, we're trying to take this all away and help you focus on the parts of your applications that your customers see, the differentiating parts that your customers care about. So this will be the last server that we see for the rest of this presentation. So where do you start with serverless? Well, I think it helps to really start with thinking about Lambda. This is the compute part of the serverless offering at AWS. And if you know some of the attributes of Lambda, this can help inform how you think about building your applications. And so Lambda runs on demand. If you're not using it, you don't pay for it. Something has to cause your application to trigger and the Lambda function to run. It supports many runtimes. So you can use Node, Python, .NET, Ruby, really whatever you prefer to bring. You can also bring custom runtimes. So we have customers running PHP, and even, Co even uh, COBOL in some cases. It responds to events. So the events are the trigger for these functions. That what causes your code to run. It's stateless. So when the, f the function first runs, it doesn't know about anything that happened before. And so you have to factor that into how you build applications. And it scales automatically. So whether you're calling your function once a year or 100 times a minute, the Lambda service in the background provisions the resources to make sure that it runs reliably and on queue. So knowing some of those things and seeing how people have built applications over the years, I've discovered there are some best practices in thinking about how you start to put this together. One is to avoid lifting and shifting. This is taking the code from your server-based environment, picking it up, and just dropping it in the Lambda function. And if you do that, that'll work, but you're not really getting the benefits of a serverless app, as you'll see a little bit later. It's often good to build one Lambda function per purpose. So these are functions. You want to keep your functions small. It makes it easier for them to test. It makes it better for reuse when you want to use the functions in other projects. 
Functions being small can often mean that these are 20 to 50 lines of code, by the way. So if you write very short Lambda functions, that can f seem a bit weird when you first start getting into serverless, but trust me, it's kind of normal. You can choose the right runtime. So in normal based server-based applications, often you're building around one runtime because you've got a server running everything. And often that means forcing your team to use one runtime for everything. Because app workloads in serverless tend to be a federation of different functions, you can actually pick and choose your runtimes. You could say, I want to use Python for the data intensive parts of the workload, or I want to use Node where I'm handling JSON, for example. And you want to think about functions as being plumbing between different services that, you're be that are being used. So this is really just the business logic, and it's not the major part of your application. And the thing I want to throw in at the end here is that security still matters. So we say at AWS that security is job number one, but really for all of us in this room, security is also job number one, and it becomes ever more important. Now, if you build applications the, the most secure way, making sure that you apply the principles of least privilege at each step of the application, you can actually build incredibly secure serverless apps too. So I took a lot of the practices that I've seen have worked for me and also for other customers and came up with a general approach to thinking about this. And I'll apply these in all of the examples I show later, but just some things to think about. So if you take a features first approach, breaking down the application into the core features that your customers use, this can help avoid monolithic thinking where you end up with one big Lambda function with everything in it. Actually start with the features to help you guide that way. If you focus on events, and remember events are the key to your serverless apps actually working in the first place, this also informs the flow of data in your app. So an event could be anything such as an HTTP call, it could be a button from an, an IoT button press, or it could be an object being stored in an S3 bucket. There are really thousands of different types of event, but those help drive the flow within your workload. Statelessness can be one of the harder problems to get your head around when you first come into serverless because we're so used to keeping state somewhere in memory in our servers. But really, this is the key to understanding scale. If you look at most Amazon services, statelessness is enabling the application to um, load itself horizontally in all sorts of different ways. And so the sooner you adopt that, the easier it is to bring true scale to your application workload. And I also think data flow is incredibly important too. You know, many of us have come from a background where we have one database doing everything in our apps really. And in this model, you have a whole range of different databases and data stores available in AWS and also other providers too. Many people use services like Mongo and other databases. But if you think about how the data flows and transforms between those different data stores, that can help you then design the rest of your architecture around the data itself. And then finally, always be thinking about the services first. So again, you'll see a little bit of this in the, in the examples, but if you look, look at your architecture and you see Lambda featuring really prominently, you're probably not making the best use of all the different services that you could. So I keep talking about services, but what do I mean? Well, people think that serverless is synonymous with Lambda, but really that's just the compute part of the offering here. But there are really many other things we rely upon making all of this work. You've got API Gateway that provides the front door to your application on the back end. There's DynamoDB that provides very low latency, very high scale, no SQL storage for your application. SC provides an object store. This is very useful for user data, things like photos within your app, for example. And for really complex workflows that have lots of spaghetti code, the services like step functions it makes it very easy to extract all of that complexity and have a service handle that too. Now you also have events, notifications, and queues. These are important in distributed apps. And there are specialized services as well. You have Kinesis for real-time ingestion of data, or you have IoT for interacting with the Internet of Things, and even things like Elastic Transcoder if you're working with large media files. We also have access to many application services that can be really powerful for building our applications, often around machine learning. So you'll see things like recognition for image recognition, comprehend for sentiment analysis, text transcribe, and so on and so forth. And my point here is not to overwhelm you with services, because AWS has lots of them, but really to think about it as a serverless developer, you've got this enormous rich toolbox to play with, and you can use any of these or none of these in your app, depending on what you see fit. So in these examples I want to show you today, which is the bulk of what we're going to be talking about, 
I'm going to start with a couple of fairly simple examples. And I've used my experience as a software developer to know that I don't know the requirements up front, and they're going to change a lot. So I want to add some subsequent requirements to what we're building so you get a sense of how we can modify the architecture and take advantage of the agility you get with serverless for things you had no idea about when you first started building the app. So first of all, let's start with something very straightforward, a form upload. So we're going to create a serverless application that supports a customer review form submitted on a web page. So we already have an existing website. That works. That's fine. We're going to build some JavaScript and add this feature where we can store customer reviews. So let's look at this architecture. So very simply, our website's on the left. We're going to use API Gateway as a way for it to connect to our back end. That's going to call a Lambda function. And then we're going to take the customer review we're given and put it in a DynamoDB table. So this just uses three services. Now, these three services actually are a very powerful combination for building really practically any type of CRUD-style application, you know, create, read, update, delete. Anytime you take data, you need to store it somewhere, this is a good pattern to use. But of course, it's not, not really that simple. So what's our next requirement we're going to have? Well, it turns out our website is a global website where people submit reviews in many different languages. And we're not thought about this. And we need to convert all of these reviews into English, or really any base language you prefer. But it has to just be one language. So what can we do to modify the structure here? Well, we could take that first Lambda function and make it call some sort of ML service to do the translation for us before we put it in the database. But then we're starting to get towards this monolithic design where the Lambda function is doing more than one thing. And over time, we'll start to bloat that Lambda function. So instead, what we can do is this. So DynamoDB triggers an event called a stream that when data arrives in the table, we can listen to that event. So when that first review gets written to DynamoDB, we'll have it call a second Lambda function. And then we'll use the AWS Translate service to then do the translation into our base language that will get that translation and put it back into DynamoDB. Now, by doing this, we've not changed any of the first part of our architecture. We've just incrementally added to address this new user feature. What next? Well, it also, it turns out that our user reviews are not just text. People want to be able to upload images with their user reviews as well. So we hadn't thought about that. Now, this is a problem because in server-based environments, often you'll find if you work with web or mobile apps, any type of upload from users can be massive. You're dealing with very large files, takes up a lot of network bandwidth. You have to store the images in some temporary space on your server before you process and save somewhere else. So what can we do without really changing the entire nature of the application we've built? You know, we could potentially have, again, that first Lambda function do the work. It could take the binary that's uploaded, and we could store it somewhere. But instead, we can do this. So we'll introduce a third Lambda function. And in this case, it'll be a second API gateway path that the front end will call. This Lambda function will call S3, which is where we're going to store the eventual image. And it will ask for permission using a pre-signed URL. That's basically like a temporary token for storing an S3. That Lambda function will then return that token to the front end. And the front end will directly store the binary in S the S3 service. Now, by doing it this way, we've offloaded the entire problem to the S3 service. So if we get gigabytes of uploads every hour, it's not our problem anymore. It's actually just been pushed to S3. And if we need to do other things with those objects, we can listen to events coming from the S3 buckets. But in this simple design, we've solved that problem, allowing customers to make an image upload in addition to the text upload. OK, so our review process is working really well. We've got thousands of reviews being submitted on our website. Customers seem to love this. But now we find that some customers don't love everything we do, and we'd like to take action when we get negative reviews. So we need to be able to email negative reviews to a manager or someone in, in charge so they can take the next steps. Well, this also is a tough problem, because any type of sentiment analysis on a review is going to involve some sort of machine learning service. And if you want to use that in a server-based environment, that's fairly complicated to set up these types of models so they work effectively. In this, way, this world, what we're going to do is use a service called Amazon Comprehend. And again, I'm just going to create a fourth Lambda function now 
There's also listening to that DynamoDB stream. So when the review is written to the table, that's going to trigger the stream, trigger my Lambda function. That's then going to take this user review that's now been already converted into one base language, send that to Comprehend. That will give us a score between 0 and 1 on the positive or negative nature of the review. And then we'll have the Lambda function set a tolerance, maybe 70%. And if we get a negative review, it will then email using SNS or SES, depending on what you prefer. So in each one of these steps, we've incrementally added and addressed each one of these features using another Lambda function and another service. And so if this were a production application, we didn't need to really take it offline or do anything, because we're not changing any code that's in place. We're just continuing to bolt on additional features and functions. Now we have one final request that's come in now. So in this case, we've built an application with an open front door. There's no authentication, and that's a problem. We're getting lots of spam. Generally, you don't want to have an open front door that way. So we want to make sure that the existing authentication on the site is used to secure this back end. Now again, in the server-based world, this can be a bit tricky, because often we have this kind of castle and moat approach to security there. And we have to figure out how the security works in that environment and integrate with that effectively. In this space, what we can do is use Cognito. You can also use services like Auth0 if you're using services um, already. And this works by using a JSON web token. So the originating website can give us a JSON web token that's then uh, checked by Cognito or Auth0. It's validated against the provider. API Gateway is integrated with Cognito, so it'll do all this for us. And then anything that continues past this point is already authenticated in our app. So we don't need to do anything else then to secure the rest of the application. And so that provides a very simple, elegant way of providing very robust security for your app. The one thing I'd add about this is that people often are very tempted to write their own security in their apps, and please don't do that. So please make sure whatever your solution is, you use some industrial strength security like Cognito or Auth0 to solve the problem. So that's the simple example. So let's get on to something a little bit more interesting. So in this case, I'm going to have a restaurant reservation app. We're going to create a serverless application to allow a restaurant, uh, their customers, to reserve a table with SMS text message. So we work for a restaurant, and they want customers to better send a text message, and then we'll receive that message, and then an operator at the restaurant will then have a computer where they can see restaurant reservations coming in, and then that helps the customers in terms of providing reservations automatically. So in this case, in the simple case, we've got a couple of services that can help us do this. The first is Pinpoint. Pinpoint can give you a phone number that you can then give to your customers. And then when they send a text message, it receives that text message and then turns it into an event. Now remember, events are all over AWS. So anytime we can create an event, we can build a serverless application to listen to that event. So we'll build a Lambda function that will receive that text message from Pinpoint. And then that's going to send the text message to EventBridge. Now I'm going to introduce something a bit different here. So instead of me just putting it into a DynamoDB table, I'm going to use an event-driven architecture. So I'm going to put the text message into event EventBridge. And you'll see in a little while why that can help us address some of the other changes that are coming down the pipe with this application. So that's the producer side of our app. We've got an event coming in from this text message. Now on the other side, We've got a web app that our front desk is going to be using to see these reservations. And that web app will then use API Gateway to call DynamoDB to get a list of all the reservations that are coming in. And that's how they're going to see the data that's being stored internally in the system. And so just by combining these few services, and really the Lambda functions would be about 20 to 30 lines of code in this case, we've got a restaurant reservation app that will securely handle text messages on the back end. There's only one problem with this design we've got, is that it's not real time. So people are using it. They love the application, but they're having to F5 their browser constantly to see when new reservations are coming in. And they don't know if someone has now placed a new reservation. So how do you handle this? Well, you could poll more frequently. That's always an option. So if you're polling every two minutes, poll every one minute to suit for new reservations. But we don't want to do that. That's really inefficient. We want a real-time solution so that when people place these reservations, they automatically appear within the web app itself. So here's what we'll do. 
And this is why I introduced the event bridge idea using an event bus. I'm going to create a rule in event bus, shown in the little pink icon there. That's going to listen for new reservations coming in. That will call my third Lambda function. And when it receives a reservation, I'm going to have that published to IoT Core, which is a service within AWS, which we can use for web apps to be able to create WebSocket subscriptions. So now the front end just needs a WebSocket subscription to IoT Core. And any time these text messages come in, they'll automatically be published through to the front end. And again, with about 20 lines of code in that Lambda function, we've created a real-time web app integration. So next on our list of requirements, our front desk host would like us to have it so that we speak the name of guests when their table is ready. So there'll be some sort of computer that sits there and says, table for two for James at 7.30 is now ready. So again, this, this is a tricky one in a server-based environment because text-to-speech is, again, an ML-based problem. You take some, some sort of text string you want converted into some sort of spoken text and then played through an audio. And that's actually a bit tricky to do. What we can do here is create another event bridge rule that will listen to these text messages or listen for events indicating that tables are ready. That will then call a Lambda function that picks up the event, and it will call a service called Poly. Poly is a service that will create this text-to-speech audio file for us. It creates a little MP4 file. We specify the type of speaker we want, how fast, how slow, any sort of parameters we have about how it should be spoken. And it's an asynchronous call. So when it's created that file, it'll then drop that in an S3 bucket. And then when S3 is successfully stored and written that object, that creates an event. And so that's going to trigger our second Lambda function in this sequence that will let I IoT Core know that the fr that let the front end know that this audio file is now ready. And it'll pass along the URL to the file so the front end can now play the audio clip. So again, we've incrementally added this feature without changing anything else that we've built already. And we've solved something that's actually relatively complicated to put together, really with probably about 40 or 50 lines of code by pulling these services together. So our next challenge, our, the manager of the restaurant is thinking this is a fantastic solution we've built here, but they'd like to have a daily reservation email saying how many people book tables at 11 o'clock each night, just some sort of summary report. Well, this turns out to be a really good fit for serverless because it involves a cron job. And cron jobs and serverless kind of go hand in hand. And so we can solve this one very easily. We just create another rule at 11 o'clock at night or whenever we want this to run. This is going to then call a Lambda function. It'll query that DynamoDB table to fetch, fetch the list of reservations that we've had for the day. And it will then use a service like SNS or SES to then send the email to the manager or any interested party. That's an easy one. Finally, we now want to alert a legacy application when reservations have been made. So it turns out that we're not working for one restaurant. We're actually working for a restaurant chain like McDonald's, somebody really busy. And they get lots and lots of reservations. And they're already integrated with another service like OpenTable or some sort of legacy system that we didn't know about when we built this solution. So this is a problem for us. And we have to do this integration, otherwise people could accidentally double book the same tables. And so the third party provider has given us a webhook that we can connect with. And so what can we do now to integrate all of this web with a webhook? Well, webhooks are kind of tricky because although they might seem simple, there are some problems you might not have thought about. If that legacy service goes down and they don't receive the information, what do you do? Are you going to retry later? What's your retry strategy on making sure that they do get that information? What about if this is a really busy restaurant chain and we're getting tons of reservations, and we might overwhelm that downstream system with lots of reservations. How do we throttle the number of API calls so that we don't take down that downstream system? One of the things with serverless apps is they scale very quickly, so it's very possible to accidentally take down systems that are not serverless. So we have to think about that too. Well, we have a good solution for this with EventBridge. So in this case, there's a feature called API destinations. And in all this case, we just have to take that API webhook they've given us, and configure that in our rule. And that will do two things. Firstly, it will throttle the number of requests being made so that we don't overwhelm that downstream system and we only make the number of requests per second that we think we're safe to do. And it will queue up all those other requests so that the actual demand curve is smoothed out as all of those come in. 
Also, if the API endpoint goes away for any reason, it'll handle the retry. It'll continue for up to 24 hours using exponential back off. So just by configuring the rule, we don't actually need to think about all of these complexities and making sure the webhook is successfully called. So those are two examples, but obviously when you look at what I'm showing you here, there's lots of different services and things you have to configure to really make the best use of this in your workload. So I wanted to show you a couple of ways you can do this as developers, and I think it's really important. Now, you might be using services like Terraform or Serverless Framework or any of those, and if you are, please keep using them. This is for everybody who's not yet using some sort of IAC tool that can help automate what you're doing. So we have a service called SAM, the Serverless Application Model. You've probably seen the squirrel at our booth out there. And what this is, it takes the definition of all of these applications I'm showing you with all of the different resources and converts them to CloudFormation, which is really the language of AWS. And so, so Sam can then convert all of this into CloudFormation easily for you. Now, a lot of people feel that sometimes this sounds a bit scary or complicated, but it doesn't have to be. This is an example Sam template I built for a language translation app in one of my repos. And it shows how you've got an S3 bucket a, a Lambda function, and also it defines the event here that connects the two. So when an object is put into the S3 bucket, that will trigger then my Lambda function, in this case for a suffix of TXT. And so you build out this application using YAML and define the resources that you have this way. And then you have the SAM CLI that then takes this YAML, and it will convert all of that to the real resources on the right. And so the benefit of doing this is that if you're building apps, instead of clicking through the console and making these changes, you're creating versionable templates that you can share with other developers in your team. And you can also more easily then store in services like GitHub. And then when you make changes to your app, it'll only deploy the differences in the template, not the whole stack. And so I recommend as you start to build these types of applications, you adopt using this approach because it can make a big difference to the efficiency of how you build apps. So just before we get into some questions, I wanted to talk about just some of the things we've covered, because I know we've gone through quite a few things here. So as you think about building serverless apps, break up your application into the different features that are requested by your customers. Generally, this is not that intuitive as we build things as developers, because often we're used to getting all of our requirements in once and trying to make these decisions early on in the application design process. But the problem with that is, of course, requirements change. And really, we want to be as agile as possible. So I think sticking with features and understanding how those evolve in your app is going to be a key to helping you develop and evolve your application as it changes. Don't forget to find services to do all of the heavy lifting in this as well. So I've shown you a few here today. You've got API Gateway and DynamoDB and SQS and EventBridge. And there's, I think there's 180-something in AWS now. There are lots outside of AWS as well. You know, if you're doing payment processing, you might use Stripe, for example. Or with Auth, you might use services like Auth0. But really look at all these services that can do some com really complicated things for you. And then use your Lambda functions as the glue to tie all of these together. And then probably the most important thing in this is don't be afraid to experiment. So I've shown you a few solutions for different problems of how I'd put these together. But in reality, there's lots of different ways to solve the same problem. And so with serverless applications, it's very easy to stand up infrastructure and then tear it down as you need. You're not really committing that much. It's actually fairly inexpensive to use this. So you know, make sure you, you, you experiment to learn the best way to build things. Now, if you want to learn more about building serverless applications, we've got a website for you called Serverless Land. This is created and managed by the DA team that I'm part of. And in here, we've got lots of blogs, uh, reviews, uh, blogs, uh, videos, uh, sample applications, and patterns. The patterns repo is very helpful. So if you know you need to use a couple of different services, you can go in there, specify the services that you want to use, and then download sample templates in SAM, CDK, Terraform, using whatever runtime you prefer. That can help you get started with your apps. So I recommend checking that out. Also, if you really want to see a live production serverless app in the wild, in the main part of the expo hall, you'll see Serverless Espresso. This is our serverless booth where you can order a cup of coffee with your phone by scanning a QR code. And that then uses a step functions workflow to manage the whole backend app. And that's something we've been presenting at reInvent, Summit, and other sessions. But if you meet us over there and have any questions, you can get a cup of coffee, download the code to the app, and see how it's built. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.